In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one essence with the Father, through whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became human, and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried, and rose on the third day according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, and who spoke through the prophets, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge my baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I expect the resurrection of the dead and life of the age to come. Amen. Um, but, uh, last week, if you remember, for those of you who were here, we spoke about the myrrh-bearing women, why we celebrate them and, and their role in the church and what they did for us. So this week, we celebrated an important feast, but a feast which usually is bypassed, especially these days, um, on Wednesday. We call it mid-Pentecost. And up until recently, I think that even a lot of churches, and maybe still, maybe still a lot of churches, uh, don't serve the Divine Liturgy on that day or don't have a service for that day, because I think over time, for some reason, it's, it's lost its significance amongst us and amongst the faithful, which is quite sad uh, because this is a, it's, it's a feast which the church gives a lot of emphasis on um, and carries out like any other feast for one of the major feasts, any other major feast, it carries for eight days. And it's the day where we celebrate the holy wisdom of God. So... I think that all of you here are familiar with the church in Constantinople, the great church, which is called what? Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia. And many of us think that uh, many of us think that that church is dedicated to the martyr Sophia and her three daughters. Um, the church Hagia Sophia has nothing to do with the martyr Sophia and her three daughters, but is dedicated to the holy wisdom of God, the Sophia to Theu, the to Theu Sophia, so the wisdom of God. So that church, if it was still under uh, Christian hands, would have celebrated on Wednesday, basically. And there are many churches throughout the world and many replicas built of the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, which carry the same name, the wisdom of God. Um, and for us, I think it's, it's a feast like any other great feast with, with a great importance. And why? Because we all rely on the wisdom of God. Everything comes, our whole spiritual life is built upon the wisdom that God gives us. And not any type of worldly wisdom but the divine wisdom which we ask for. You see, we have these beautiful books in the Old Testament which are called wisdom books. The wisdom of Solomon and the wisdom of Sirach and even the book of Proverbs. I suggest for you who have not read those three books in the, in the Old Testament, because I know that a lot of the times the Old Testament can be um, a little bit confusing for some of you, um, a lot of people make the mistake that when they open up their scripture, when they open up the Bible, um, to read the Bible for the first time, they open up from Genesis, from the very beginning, from the Old Testament. And that's a mistake. 
we don't read the Bible from Genesis. We read the Bible from the New Testament onwards and then go back to the Old Testament. And a lot of the times we, even us as spiritual fathers, recommend to people that they read the New Testament a few times and many times so that they, they are familiar with the New Testament so that then they can go back and somehow understand the meanings of the Old Testament. But regardless of that, there are a few books in the Old Testament which I think that anyone can read and very easily understand. And some of those books are, I mean, the first being the book of Psalms, the Psalms of David, which is not just a book which we read for knowledge, but we read for prayer as well. A lot of our hymns, a lot of our services, the church services are structured around the Psalms. And then the, the wisdom books, so the wisdom of Sirach, the wisdom of Solomon, and um, Proverbs. Those are very, very simple books. And so Solomon says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Okay. Now when we say the fear of God, obviously, acknowledgement, the acknowledgement that for us God is everything. And not just a part of our life, that He is our life. And that He is everywhere present that he fills all things that we say in the scriptures and that we say in the prayers as well, that he fills everything. So the acknowledgement of that is the beginning of wisdom. And so this wisdom we find in not only those who were educated and those who know how to read, but this type of wisdom we found even in the uneducated. And so the Gospel reading for um, Wednesday, when we read the Gospel reading, was about Christ speaking amongst the Jews in the temple and talking to them about Scripture and explaining Scripture to them. And people were wondering, how did this person <coughs> obtain such wisdom? How did this person understand these things? And isn't he the carpenter's son they were asking isn't he joseph he has no education he has no nothing but we know is god he was he had the wisdom of god but the funny thing is i remember as well as as a young child i remember as a, as a young child my grandmother even to this day who cannot who cannot read a newspaper or any other any type of material and for some reason, she's able to open up the scriptures and read the scriptures for her whole, her whole life. And we see this a lot in um, the older generation. They have no formal education whatsoever. They didn't go to school. And if they did go to school, it was usually the first or second grade. Um, they were pulled out of school. And so they don't know how to even write their name. And so what was their signature? Because they didn't know how to write their name. Well, it was the, the cross. <laughs> That's why they would say to the people, they would say to people that didn't know, put your cross here, they'd say. In other words, sign here. Vale to Stavrosu. So that's how they were used to sign, because they didn't know how to write. That's my yaya. My grandmother doesn't know how to write. She doesn't know whatever. But for some reason, when it came to the scriptures, when it came to the lives of, when it comes to the lives of the saints, she opens and she reads and she used to actually I used to sit next to her in the evenings when I'd stay at her house because I'd spend a lot of time at her house and sit next to her by the fireplace and she would read to me the scripture she would read to me the lives of the saints one of the lives of the saints that she read with well, the first one was the life of Saint Andrew the fool for Christ if any of you are familiar with with um, the life of Saint Andrew the fool for Christ if you're not I highly recommend it. It's a, it's, um, a beautiful story and a beautiful um, book to read. Um, and the other day as well, the other day I was, um, and some people that I come in contact, every, everyday people that I come in contact with um, who are illiterate, who haven't done any formal theological studies or anything, and you see that um, they're able to 
not only read the scriptures but also explain the scriptures as well um, I was with some, one of those people the other day um, I sat down with him for a bit a, a very old man in his 90s and he was sitting and he was telling me uh, about the scriptures but not only that he was dissecting it and he was explaining in um, not only in his own way but the way that the way that uh, it was so you see the Holy Spirit has no limits and has no boundaries and we will that's what we, we're going to remember that as well on the day of Pentecost we will chant that 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 the Holy Spirit descended upon those who were illiterate in other words on the fishermen it says you who showed the fishermen who to be all wise and these illiterate men and women were able to go to the ends of the world and spread the gospel of Christ um, and so we celebrated this feast as a midpoint between Pascha and Pentecost the two most important feasts of the church Pascha and Pentecost Pascha being obviously the resurrection of Christ and our own personal resurrection but also Pentecost which is the descent of the Holy Spirit so even our preparation now the church in its own way is reminding us and preparing us through the celebration of Pascha that there's still more to come and which is the descent of the Holy Spirit in order to complete our spiritual cycle okay the spiritual um, the spiritual life remember even in the Acts of the Apostles where certain people were baptized I can't remember now which who they were who were baptized and they were baptized by someone and but the Apostle said to them um, that Oh, the, the apostles had to go to them to give them the Holy Spirit okay so that they could receive the Holy Spirit their baptism wasn't complete if they did not receive the Holy Spirit so we'll, having said that and a continuation of that is what we will speak about or what we will the gospel which we will hear on Sunday which is the gospel of the Samaritan woman so that you can understand in one way or in, in some way um, the wisdom of God now this gospel I'll read you the gospel it's a bit of a lengthy one but it's taken from John's gospel chapter 4 he says so he came to a city of Samaria which is called Sikam, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his own to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, "Give me a drink." For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep where then do you get that living water are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock Jesus answered and said to her whoever drinks of this water will thirst again but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life the woman said to him sir give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw Jesus said to her go call your husband and come here the woman answered and said I have no husband 
Jesus said to her, You have well said I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to her, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this, and at this point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps rejoices together. For in this the, for in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not laboured, Others have laboured, and you have entered into their labours. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all things that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. Amen. So that was the, the reading that we will hear this Sunday. The, we, the reading of the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman is a very interesting figure. A woman whom we know was not even a Jew. And yet Christ revealed to her some of the most um, some of the most important truths of our faith so we do dissect it a little bit you'll notice that over the next few weeks everything that we speak about is around water last week was the healing of the paralytic and that paralytic the healing of the paralytic um, was done at the pool of Siloam there um, Christ healed the paralyzed man. This week, we hear that um, even now in the hymns that we heard in, during mid-Pentecost and on Sunday, Christ being the living water. And this conversation now happens at the well. Next week is about the blind man. And Jesus now causes, makes clay from the earth, puts it on the blind man and tells him to go and wash himself again. So this whole idea, this whole um, thing around water, which we know symbolizes cleansing, which symbolizes baptism, and these two things now will go together, the baptism and the Holy Spirit. 
So he stops at this city of Sichar, which we know as Samaritans. What's strange about all of this is that usually when Jews wanted to go into a Samaritan village, they would walk around the village and not through it. And there he stops at a well. He walks through the city and stops at the well, which is Jacob's well. Jacob's well was important not only to the um, Samaritans, but to the Jews, because it was built by the patriarch Jacob. Now, the Samaritans had that well. It says he went there at the sixth hour, which was 12 o'clock noon. For anyone who knows, 12 o'clock noon um, was a strange time of the day to go to the well. It wasn't, a, it wasn't usually... Um, the, it wasn't usually the time that people will go to the well. Today I went to the, um, to the nursing home and there when I was, I spoke to them again about, I spoke to them as well about this, this gospel reading. And I said to them, how many of you uh, remember before there was water in your homes? How many of you in your villages had to actually go to a well and, and take water, collect water? And a few of them did. A few of them remember the days before there was water in their homes and i said when would you go to the well when was the time that you went to the well and they said you either went in the evening uh, just before sunset so that there's water for the next day or you had to get up very very early in the morning if our mums wanted to do some washing you had to get up very early in the morning and get water then you would never go in the middle of the day in the heat and carry all those things and plus it wasn't practical so we know that there was a reason why this woman, um, the Samaritan woman, went to the well in the, uh, in the middle of the day, and that was because she wanted to avoid contact with other people. And we find out later in the Gospel reading why. She sa um, Christ says to her, give me some water to drink. And she says to Christ, if you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, and you're asking me for water to drink, we don't associate with each other, Apparently to you we're unclean and all these things. Christ simply says to her um, that if you knew who was um, asking you for this water, then you would be asking me to give you water because um, it says whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So then she asks him for water. See, we can see from this woman that she has a good disposition. She has this goodness in her. Something, there was a yearning. So she says to him, give me some of this water. There's a faith in her. And then Jesus now continues and says go and bring your husband and tell him to come here tell him to come to me and now Jesus is provoking her knowing exactly what the answer would be God uh, uh, sir he's not God sir I have no husband you're right she says that you have no husband because you've had five husbands and none of them were good enough for you. And now the person that you're living with is you're living in sin. You're not even married to this person. So Christ basically, in a very subtle way, exposes her. But you see the, uh, something different in this woman. Something very strong, powerful. Because when Christ says this, she doesn't stop to say oh, you offended me you know and how dare you and the very famous one who are you to judge me <laughs> you can't judge me you know all the things you know that we we say to cover up our own sins and our own vromies okay so rather than getting offended and getting all uptight and, and trying to excuse herself and try to say, well, you know, the first one I had cheated on me and the second one was beating me and the other, third one was whatever. She didn't do any of that. 
like I said, she had a good disposition. And she says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And she asks him her first question, she asks him, not trying to excuse herself, not trying to do anything, but asks, We as Samaritans said that we are to worship God on this mountain. You as Jews say that we are to worship God in Jerusalem, at the temple there. What's the right thing to do? So see where this woman's heart was. Yes, she may not have had the best reputation. And because she didn't have this reputation, this good reputation, she may have burnt bridges with the people around her. She may have become an outcast to everyone, okay? That she was embarrassed to face the people and that's why she didn't want to contact anyone. That's why she went to the well by herself and not with the other women as what they would have done. Yes, she may have fallen into sin after sin after sin. But Christ sees the depths of her heart. And sometimes, sometimes, because we are searching, but we do not know where to search, it does sometimes lead us to search in the wrong places. Like the Samaritan woman did. She had a yearning. She had an emptiness that she wanted to fill. But she didn't know how to fulfill this emptiness. So she went from one person to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other, and the other. Okay? And none of that satisfied her. None of it satisfied her. How many times do people do, the, do, do exactly the same thing? People. We all do exactly the same thing. How do people get themselves in trouble? How do people end up with addictions, with drugs, with alcohol, with gambling, with pornography, with all of these things? Because they're searching for something. There's an emptiness there. And they're trying to fill that emptiness. And they don't know how to. They haven't found the way. Nothing's been exposed to them of what there is to fill this emptiness. And that's why Christ comes and says, I am the living water. Okay? And he uses water specifically. He doesn't use someone's stomach. He doesn't use, say, he doesn't use any other image to say that he's there to fill. Right? He says, I am the living water. Simply because when we want to fill ourselves, when do we want to feel refreshed, there is nothing more refreshing than, than water. And Christ get, comes and says, and, and identifies himself with this element, which we know is something that will refresh and water us. Who doesn't need water? Everyone needs water. Water is the source of life, at least physical life. And just as water is the source of physical life, and anything that lives needs water in order to survive, Christ identifies himself with this element to say, well, if you want to have life, then you need to also be watered. But life within you, life in your soul, which is Christ. Okay? So if you want your soul to be living and not dead, then you need to water it and nurture it with Christ, basically. And so, this woman, because she was searching and because she didn't know where to find, what it led her to have this, these husbands or whatever, relationships that weren't fulfilling enough for her. But Christ, knowing the depth of her heart, sees what she was truly searching for. The moment she came into contact, the moment she came into contact with someone that could fulfill her heart, she asked the question, where do I worship God? How do I worship God? What is the proper way okay, to come into communion with the divine? And here we have 
the second part of the gospel, which I think that is very, very relevant because it exposes something which I think a lot of us bypass. It exposes the mystery of the Holy Trinity, everything that we believe in. Okay? Christ gives her the answer by saying that neither here on this mountain do we worship God or in Jerusalem. A time will come where we will worship God in spirit and in truth. Okay? So that anywhere, because he says God is spirit, but he does tell her as well, listen, the truth will come of the Jews, through the Jews, through the Jewish race. And because we know that up until the coming of Christ, it was through the Jews that they had the prophets. It was the, through the Jews that the, the law came and everything that spoke about Christ. Now, the Samaritans, the Samaritans were a sect. They were like according to the Jews they were like heretics they had taken out a lot of the books from the Old Testament and if I'm not a bit mistaken I think they only used the first five books of the Old Testament everything everything else they, they, they took away okay so Christ now Christ continues and starts to reveal the great mystery to her the mystery of the Holy Trinity he says God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But the arrow is coming, he says, when the true worshippers... Okay, sorry, I, I, the, I want to read you. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, because the truth is salvation is for, of the Jews. Okay, but the arrow is coming, he says, and now is... When the true worshippers will find the Father in spirit and in truth. So, he identifies, first and foremost, they will find the Father. Okay? So he identifies God as the Father. And now he continues and he says, For the Father is seeking to such worship, to such worship him. And then he says, God is his spirit so now he identifies the third person of the holy trinity which is the holy spirit that god is not just the father he's also a spirit as well and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth then the woman said to him then the woman continues the conversation and says when the messiah comes he will teach us all these things Okay, and he says, and Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. Okay, so the second person of the Holy Trinity. We have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit, which is revealed to the Samaritan woman. Okay, so the, re the revealing of the mysteries of God is something which comes through the cleansing of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of the times we don't understand this, a lot of the times we can't grasp it, and especially with our logical mind we can't grasp it. And that's why even the other day in the hymns of the church there were parts where it spoke about um, not trying to grasp and understand God with our logic but with our spirit and with our soul and with our heart so this woman now after he after he says to the Samaritan woman these mysteries he reveals these mysteries to her at this point his disciples came and they marveled but there's this beautiful little um, point here the, which I think is worth noticing he says that the woman left but he left her water pot and went into the city and there in the city he started she started to tell the people to go and see Christ because there is a man there who told her everything that she ever did this little detail here that she left her water pot behind 
is very symbolic. That in other words, this woman had been wa watered with the living water, with Christ. So exactly what Christ said to her, that if you knew who it was that was asking for water, you would ask them to, to give you living water and they will, you will never thirst again. And so when she leaves to go and tell the people about Christ, the evangelist here, John, um, specifically leaves this detail there that she leaves her water pot behind. Okay? Like, if you're just reading it by reading it, what's the big deal? All right, why would you even need to mention the fact that she left her water, water pot behind? But for us, it's of great significance to show now that this wo woman now was now fulfilled, nurtured and watered with the words of Christ. Christ had filled her and given her everything that she needs. And so we as Orthodox as well know the ending of that story. And the ending of that story is that this woman, who was the Samaritan woman, converts, becomes a Christian. She converts and receives the name Fotini. Her sisters also, her five sisters convert with her because she converts her sisters. They all become Christians. And her two sons as well, she had two sons. All of them became Christians. Fotini becomes equal to the apostles. She's given the name in the church as equal to the apostles. And they all martyred for the faith. All of them all martyred. It's him. Up until to this point, does anyone have anything they'd like to say or ask? So, we see how Christ here is the living water. And a lot of the times these things, they seem uh, beautiful, like beautiful words. And in reality they are. In reality, they, truth, truth be told, they are. It's nice hearing that Christ is the living water. It's nice to hear that Christ comes and he nurtures our soul. But from a practical perspective, how, how do we make it reality? Because we know that in theory everything sounds really good, but practically, and a, a lot of us, a lot of people, and I think that when I speak about a lot of us when we say this, we don't always feel like that. A lot of the time we feel dry, we feel barrenness, especially when someone's been in the, in, in the church for a long time, in the beginning it's all nice. In the beginning it's very easy. In the beginning there's a lot of grace. And so everything seems so beautiful. Everything seems so easy. Our prayer life is lovely. We're praying on hours on end. Uh, we're, we're levitating in prayer. You know, and, and, and light is shining all around us and light is shining around everyone that we're seeing and the priests and the chanters and, and the prayers and everything seems just so grand and beautiful. And then all of the sudden, after a while, we start to fall from the clouds. And we not only fall from the clouds, but we feel like we, we hit rock bottom. And we read these words and we say, they're beautiful words, but at the moment, I'm just not feeling it. At the moment, it doesn't feel like Christ is the living water. I've turned the tap off for some reason. <laughs> Etsy. And listen, this is reality, that this does happen. And thank God it doesn't happen permanently. It doesn't happen permanently. And I was listening to this beautiful talk yesterday from uh, Metropolitan Athanasius of Limassol. But the talk was in Greek, so I can't recommend it to all of you. But it was. Um, if, if you ever, if you want to look it up in, on YouTube, it was in Greek it's called Pneumatiki Xirasia, um, which basically means spiritual barrenness. And so as much as we like to hear that everything is like the living water and fills our souls and all that, we know that a lot of the times there is this difficulty, there is this dryness that we have. 
um, as much as we want not to feel that dryness, as much as we want um, to feel that beauty in when we're praying and when we're in the liturgy, when we're in the services or when we're reading. It's not always like that. And the truth is that a lot of the times there are many distractions. Uh, as I said to you before, God um, in the beginning uh, showers us and, and not only showers us, but he spoils us with his grace. He gives us a lot of grace and that's what gets us hooked on God to say, to put it like very bluntly. That's what makes us love everything about him. Uh, but to be honest with you, uh, that's probably the most immature stage of our spiritual life. And even though we think that that's where we are, that's when we were the, the, the spiritually the highest, it's actually not. It's not when we were spiritually highest. It's when God is literally spoon feeding us. It's when we're spiritually infants, we're young. Okay, we're still babies. And so God still needs to cradle us. He still needs to hold us and, 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 and feed us with a spoon and saying, open up your mouth, let me put it in. Open up, whatever. And that's what happened. We were just sitting there like hungry little things, you know, taking it all in, you know. And we love it and it's beautiful. Okay. But then a time will come where God will say, okay, now you know where the food is. You need to start learning to come and take the food yourself okay now you need to start learning that you need to get up on your feet okay and take take off your little tricycle training training wheels you need to take them off your bike now our parents did the same thing to us and i'm using these examples of what what it was so that we can understand a lot of the times what our spiritual life is so god says to us okay I've showed you now where to find me. I've showed you now how beautiful and delightful things, things are in the life, in the spiritual life, in the life of Christ. You know where to go to find water. What you have to do now is make that effort and begin to use that nurturing yourself, okay, to show that, to show that, you can mature to show that you can grow in your own will as well and to be able to choose all right now this is important as well to be able to choose because it's exercising our free will it's exercising our free will and so when we've when we've been given these when we've had a taste of god then we know that not that we will never sin again, not that they will ever go astray, but we start to realize, okay, that this isn't, this isn't satisfying me as it did. And the change is gradual. Okay? So for example, let me bring you an example. Um, you've grown up your entire life being fed with your mum's home-cooked meals. So every day you go home and your mum has cooked you these beautiful meals and you're having these nice, warm, home-cooked meals. A time comes, but when you need to move out of home, okay? So you move out of home, you go into your own place and every day you're calling Uber Eats and one day you call Suvlakia, the other day you call Hungry Jacks, the other day you call Pizza, or the other day you call Chinese, whatever it is, okay? All right, you're feeling yourself physically, but in your mind, you're thinking to yourself, there's nothing like mum's food, okay? There's nothing like her cooking. And so this is what God does in the beginning. He gives us and he feeds us and he feeds us and he feeds us until it's time for us to go on, uh, on our own way, okay? And then we go on our own way, okay? And we think, you know, okay, well, I'm going to do this myself, and we move a little bit of strain because God now has withdrawn and says, I'm not going to cook for you anymore. Okay. He's, he's trying to give you something else. We start now to dabble again, but to dabble in our own old ways, to dabble in the things, you know, whatever. 
So, okay, all right, tonight I'm not going to pray as much. Tonight I'm going to, rather than prayer, I'm going to be on Facebook. Rather than, you know, reading, you know, I'm going to watch TV. Rather than this, I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out, you know, to a friend's place and all that. Not that that's good, but I'm just trying to think of all the distractions, you know, that, we're, that we usually have that distract us from everything else. I'm not going to church today, I'm going to sleep in. You know, uh, all, all these things. Okay? So, yeah, we might then move a bit of straight and start doing all these things. Yeah, it fills up our time, and we're always complaining that we're so busy, but it fills up our time, but we are not fulfilled. And so we remember the days. And I know this, because we all say the same thing when we go to confession. Father, I'm not feeling it. And I'm, I'm saying it as well, all right? I say the same thing. When I, I'm not feeling it. I just wanted, I wanted to be the way it was when I first came, when I could pray. I can't pray now. It's difficult to pray, okay? Church, the church services seem long. I can't, do, I can't focus when I, I'm, I'm reading. Or sometimes I'm not even spiritually reading at all. I'm not even praying. I'm going straight to bed, Okay? I spent three hours on the couch um, watching TV and whatever. And so then we know, okay, what were we doing then and what's different now? We balance. We need to find a balance. And then we need to start to separate what becomes a distraction and what's not. And another thing is we chase a lot of the times our emotions we're all about emotions these days. These days, it's all about emotions. And I'm not just talking about in the spiritual life. You know, um, I'm not just talking about in our spiritual life. I'm talking about in general. In general. How many times have we heard people saying, you know, why are you doing this? Because it feels good. And as long as it feels good for us. Everything is about how we feel. Okay? Everything is about how we can make ourselves comfortable okay but sometimes in order to progress means that we are it means we have to come out of our little comfort zone in order to face reality and so these days when i say like everything has about comfort you know the cl our clothing is about comfort our food is about comfort okay what we eat Okay, is, is all about comfort. And we even hear it as well, comfort eating. So we eat today unnecessarily, excessively, unnecessarily, what we shouldn't be eating, all these things, okay? And like we do all these things and we can't, for example, fast. And, another, and, and so we live in a, in a way which is, we like to think godly or want to have this relationship with God, but as long as we're very comfortable, okay, and we, it doesn't mean that we come out of our comfort zone, but a lot of the times it does mean breaking out of that because breaking out of that helps us grow and mature, okay. There was a few other things that I wanted to say in regards to that, but I don't even know if it's appropriate to say, you know, uh, that. But I just want to say, like, for example, the mindset of a Christian is very different to the secular mindset, okay? The mindset of a Christian is one where Christ will say, you know, if you f choose to follow me, then you need to take up your cross, Okay, if you choose to follow me, know that there will be hardships. Things won't be easy. Christ never says in the Bible and he never says in the Gospels, come follow me and then if you follow me, you'll be happy, you'll be healthy and you'll be successful. And if you think that God says that somewhere in the Bible, then please show me. Okay, But he does not say that at all. If anything, he tells us exactly the opposite. If you're stupid enough to follow me, he says, doesn't say that, sorry. 
But if you follow me, then you will become stupid to the world. Okay, you will. People will hate you. People will mock you. People will think that you're crazy. Why? Because my doctrine and my teaching is totally different to the ideas of the world. The world today tells us, be comfortable. The world today tells us, as long as you're happy, okay, nothing else matters as long as you're happy. And that's why we get to extremes which become destructive and they enter even into the mindset of the Christian person. And some of these extremes are detrimental to our souls. For example, we have an inconvenient pregnancy. And because this pregnancy is inconvenient to us, then we have the right to kill this child. Okay? Because it's inconvenient to us. Okay? Because we did something that we shouldn't have done. And rather than facing the consequences, rather than facing what is to come, then we think it's just easier to kill this child. Okay? Or because I'm sick and I'm suffering from a terminal illness. Okay? And therefore, because I'm suffering from this terminal illness, so that I'm not, in a, um, I'm not a burden on others as well, and I don't, I'm not a burden on myself, then I can just in, um, do that what you, if euthanasia. It's him. And these laws are passing now about euthanasia. Because I don't want to be a burden on others. But hold on a second. This is the way that the world thinks. Why? Because we have no concept whatsoever of the life to come. And that here, in order, like gold needs to go through fire in order to be purified, okay, and so that that gold can shine, this is the same thing here. And so this is why not only do we have the world, the word of God which tells us these things, we have the examples of the saints because we think to ourselves then because if we didn't have the saints basically if we didn't have this if we didn't have the saints we think then no one can apply these things this is impossible okay? no one is crazy enough to do the things which christ asks for us to do in the gospel and then we have the saints as living testaments to say well yes because it's been done and it's been done by all types of people in all generations. There has never been a generation that has not had saints. Okay? And certain types of saints. Because then we like to find other excuses. We say, well then, you know, I'm not these things are for monks and nuns. And in order to apply them, we need to go out to the mountains and whatever. And so then we have saints like we will celebrate on Saturday. Saint Constantine and Helen, who were emperors. Okay, Saint Helen was the empress, the mother of Saint Constantine. Saint Constantine was an emperor, who not only an emperor. Okay, do you, do you know the 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 authority that he had? He owned half the world. He owned half the world. Half of the world, the known world at the time was under his authority okay and he had all that power and despite all of that he became not only a saint of the church but equal to the apostles so he was able to be become above all of that and beyond all of that and yes we have other saints who were monks who were the monastics who were nuns we have other saints who were married okay but they everything can be applied and sometimes these difficulties in christ these difficulties in christ is where we truly discover and experience the love of christ through these difficulties. Every sacrifice that's made for the name of Christ and for his love is not left unrewarded to say. And I don't even like to say unrewarded, okay? All right, it is. It's a reward. 
but we don't do it for the reward. We do it because now we've had a taste of Christ. And because we've had a taste of Christ, there's, for us there's no going back. There's no looking back to our, our former life. Even though the old person in us, because there will always be that old person, the old person in us is continually trying to drag us back. Continuously. And it takes a long time to overcome that. One of the other big mistakes is that we make in our spiritual life, or the mistake yeah, that we make in our spiritual life, is the expectation that we have that everything will happen straight away. And it doesn't happen straight away. It happens very gradually, and it happens very slowly. Just like you didn't go from kindergarten to university, it's, you need to go through the stages. It's the same thing in our spiritual growth. We need to go through all the stages and to experience all of it, to experience the sweetness of it, to experience the bitterness of it as well, to experience the joy, to experience the sadness that comes with it. And, and, and the, even the abandonment that comes with it. And to know what it means to fall down on your knees and to weep and to cry and say, Lord, where are you? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's him. And so Christ comes as a person to show all of that to us and to say, listen, what you're going through, I also went through as well. I also experienced. But look at the end result. And the end result is resurrection, isn't it? But we're humans, we listen to it now, and we say how right, but we go out and with the first temptation we forget it again. <laughs> oh dear. Yes. That you don't that you don't lose your crown. Is that in? Apocalypse, yeah, in the Revelation, yeah, to hold on to you, basically, yeah, to hold on to your crown. And it said, um, in, with the talk that I was listening to yesterday, how beautifully the Metropolitan put it when he spoke about the, the Hebrews leaving from Egypt, how they, they left from Egypt, and their if you see now, like geographically, if you know geographically, Egypt to the Promised Land was a month's journey, okay, on foot. If you're going to go by foot, it's no more than a month's journey. How long did they spend in the desert? 40, 40 years. They spent 40 years. God did not allow them to go to the Promised Land um, until, for, until 40 years, until they themselves matured. Because even though... Um, even though they were uh, in Egypt and they stayed faithful in Egypt, it showed how immature they still w were because one temptation after the other and every time they'd be saying, well, where's God? You know, now we're, we're stuck at the, the sea. The, the, um, the, the Egyptians are going to kill us. Where's God? So Moses divides the Red Sea. Then they're hungry. Where's God? He's left us out here to die in the desert. He brings them the, um, the, the manna from heaven. And then the quails. And then the ro from the rock, he br brings water. You know? But he says, the Metropolitan says, that he, um, the important thing is that they did not return back to Egypt. They would rather die in the desert as they did die in the desert then return back to Egypt the place of bondage and slavery so it's the same thing for us in our Christian life we would rather die suffering okay we would rather be humiliated we would rather be isolated we would rather anything else slandered rather 
than return back to our slavery, rather than return back to sin. I think you were going to say something there. Yeah. No, the... In the spiritual life, does shame revolve? No. Oh, does it have a role? Does shame have a role? Yeah. We know that God is the same all the time. Yesterday, today and forever. He'll be the same. So, whatever was shameful then applies then just as much now as it did then nothing changes what it changes is our mentality our mentality changes which is not a good thing because then we start to water down everything and we have this very like i said before this very relaxed understanding you know of of even who god is you know, and the greatness of God. Once we start to have this very relaxed or being very relaxed, you know, even with sin, then we start to to lower our standards and therefore lower our goal. Our goal is to reach perfection, to reach holiness. Okay. And we cannot once, if we lower our standards and we start to see as normal things that were not normal and start to things that which were shameful now not to be shameful, then we lower our standards. And we cannot rise to the level that God not only wants us to rise to, but knows that we also have the ability to. Because God would not expect something from us that was impossible, that, that we could not do. He does not have that expectation from us. If he thought that we could not become holy, then he wouldn't have said it. But he does say, become holy. If he thought that we couldn't become perfect, then he would not have said it. But he does say to us, become perfect. And But the only difference is that we try to do it of ourselves. And that's why when the apostles say, then who can possibly be saved? Thinking that what God was asking from them was too much. He says, what is impossible for man is possible for God. So everything is done in cooperation with God. Working with him. And working with him, we work through him through the means that he's given us, through prayer, through spiritual meditation, through the sacraments, through the services of the church. Okay? It's very simple. And using our virtues the way that we should be. Yes. Ne. You just need to talk up because I can't hear. Yes, if I understood your question correctly, um, does it, you're saying does it, if, if we choose Christ, then does it affect us spiritually, mentally, psychologically? Yeah, 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 look it does, I'll tell you, it does and it doesn't. Because when we choose Christ, all of these things then begin to flow very naturally and very easily. Okay? We start to... Things that we used to dabble in and things that we used to enjoy, we realize, and even people and company that we used to like and enjoy, we realize it becomes very distasteful. 
So then it sort of becomes, because we've had a taste of Christ and there's that fulfillment of Christ, then it becomes a little bit, um, it becomes easy to detach and it doesn't affect us that much psychologically, mentally and all that. Christ, God forbid, Christ doesn't want us to be um, mentally unstable if we chose to follow, because we choose to follow him. That's not the case. But then what does happen sometimes is that and sometimes it's our fault, sometimes it's just God whatever, um, allowing it to happen, is that we start to have memories of that, and that usually happens a bit later on, of things of the past to try to make us maybe return in one way or another back to the past. It does, sometimes it does affect us. It does affect our thoughts and all that. And that's when we just struggle. We need to add in more of the struggle. Yeah. There. I'll answer you with, with the mentality of the saints. Uh, basically, the, the saints, we hear a lot of the saints, when everything was going smoothly in their life, they would say, God, why have you abandoned me? But they knew that when there was trials and tribulations, they knew that God was there. Yeah. In order to answer your question, we need to also understand what martyrdom is. So Panayot is asking now uh, that a martyr, just because they died, what if they weren't fully uh, um, mature spiritually? Uh, does that mean you know they have that same closeness with God in the kingdom of heaven? And that can they intercede for us? All right. To, uh, in order to answer your question, we need to understand what it means to go through a martyrdom. Now, to go through a martyrdom, if God allows you to be a martyr, it means that you have matured spiritually. You cannot, if you have not matured spiritually, then you could not go through martyrdom. God would not allow that to happen. And we do have many examples of that. Sometimes of people escaping martyrdom, um, not by renouncing their faith, but God protecting them and shielding them not to go through martyrdom. And in other cases, for those, you know, who were not ready, renouncing their faith, basically. So if you were deemed worthy, or if you are ever deemed worthy of being martyred, it means that you had completed and you, you had become um, spiritually mature. Yeah. So yes, definitely, they have a great boldness before God in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Έχεις την εικόνα, την εικόνα. Any other question? No. Ask for the for the prayer so we can say the resurrection prayer. Um. Εντάξει, let's pray. Having beheld the resurrection of Christ, let us worship the Holy Lord Jesus, the only sinless one. Your cross, O Christ, we venerate, and your holy resurrection we praise and glorify. For you are our God, apart from you we know no other. We call upon your name. 
Come all faithful, let us venerate the holy resurrection of Christ. For behold, through the cross, joy has come to the world. Ever blessing the Lord, let us praise his resurrection. For having endured the cross for us, he destroyed death by death. Christ is risen from the dead, by death he has trampled upon death, and to those in the tombs he is bestowing life. <laughs> 